Okay, well, I just want to welcome everybody to the School of Accountancy internal research seminar for today. Um, today, our presenter is Rebecca Russell Bennett from the School of Advertising, Marketing and PR. Now, I had a look at Rebecca's profile, particularly when I asked her, and I, I have to say it makes mine look quite <laughs> small. Um, Rebecca uh, has a lot, uh, done a lot of work and has a lot of accolades. But just to tell you briefly, Rebecca is a professor in marketing and co-director of the Center for Behavior Economics Society and Technology known as BEST. She has an international reputation for research and industry relevance in the field of social marketing and her research interests are in behavioral change, innovation and health services to name a few. She is also a leading educator in the field of marketing and is responsible for the development of the award-winning QUT, or is it Qtopia, yeah. role play simulation at QUT. Rebecca holds a PhD in brand loyalty for the services sector, is the co-editor for the Journal of Services Marketing, which is an A-ranked and Q1 journal, and has published over 250 peer-reviewed articles with more than 86 in, uh, international journals. She's worked with organisations across a variety of service industries in Australia and has received numerous awards for research and teaching excellence. We are extremely fortunate to have Rebecca here with us today to talk about how to write a literature review, uh, the use of mind maps. So I'm going to hand over to Rebecca now and uh, thank you very much again, Rebecca, for joining us today. Great. Um, well, thank you very much um, uh, for... Um, for having me. Uh, this, uh, this presentation really arose out of a session that I did for some of my research uh, students. And um, it's I think it's always nice to be able to put a bit of a systematic process around some of the things that we kind of know tacitly, uh, implicitly. Uh, and I can see someone's got their microphone on. Sam, perhaps uh, if you could just, um, thanks. Um, so, I think it helps to sort of make the things that we kind of know in our heads and get them out on paper. And what I find is whenever I do these presentations, it actually helps me do things better by having to make my process um, explicit. Um, and so that's uh, why Bronwyn asked me to share this. Um, I, was, I was doing this with um, uh, re research students. So I'm going to take you through the process that I use. Um, let me just put the caveat there. This is not the definitive process. It is a process for use doing literature reviews. Um, I'm a really visual person. So for me, mind maps speak clearer to me than say a whole bunch of tables or a spreadsheet, but everyone's different. So it, it's kind of take out of this what you will. Um, if this sort of resonates with you, great, use it. If it doesn't, you know, well, you know, discard it. But if you're a really visual person um, and if you like students being able to meet with you and get their point across to you really easily and succinctly with one piece of paper, um, then this, this is going to offer some, um, some strategies um, for you. So, again, not the only way of doing it, but it's a way that I found um, that does work. Okay. So next slide. Okay, so we're going to go through why do a lit review. Uh, I'm going to give you my steps um, for conducting a literature review. I'm going to um, show you how I develop a search strategy. Uh, and this is particularly useful if um, you're trying to do uh, a literature review to be published. So a systematic literature review or critical literature review or something along those lines. So it's simply not just the back end of doing uh, um, any kind of research, but it's where the literature review might be an output in its own right. Uh, so that becomes quite important to be very explicit about your search strategy. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of some of the mind maps that I've done, some of that my students have done. And this follows directly on from the session earlier in the week uh, where we had two of our brilliant research students in um, uh, the BEST Centre uh, showing how to use the visual tool um, Miro uh, and how they organise um, uh, their, um, their, their literature and then, then we'll conclude. Okay, so now I'm hoping that the next slide is going to work properly. It uh, should be a, um, yep, okay, Slido. So what I'd like you to do is pull out your phones and uh, use your QR code reader and you should be able to go in and um, uh, enter in some words. What is the purpose of a lit review that you think? And so what should happen is that a word cloud starts appearing on our screen. 
So if you can all do that, and then I'm going to log in as well and make sure that everything's turned on. So we'll just take a few moments to do this. Okay, yay, it is working. So just type keywords that, what do you think is the purpose of a literature review? If you like some of the keywords, you can repeat them. That'll make them bigger in our word cloud. And by the way, Slido is an excellent tool and there is a plugin that goes with PowerPoint. So you can use that in PowerPoint. So there's a little handy tip. I use this a lot in my teaching to get students to interact um, online. Great, so some of the keywords I'm seeing coming through there are patterns and knowledge. Yep, background. And Slido is free too, by the way, with its basic functions. So you can do polls and these sorts of things, but I like the integration feature with PowerPoint. Okay, so knowledge is really coming through. So that would be about understanding what knowledge we already know and the knowledge that we're going to be creating. So, you know, literature reviews can be both a backward looking and also a forward setting um, role, depends on how you're using that. Okay, all right, so we'll move on now. Okay, so what, what is a lit review? Okay, so um, a literature review, as I said, has a couple of different functions. It gains an understanding of the previous research on a topic, um, but it also is to help you justify the need for your research. So it's both backward and forward looking. So it's kind of got to um, have that dual, dual purpose. Um, for those who look at um, using gaps, well, it's an important way of establishing a gap. For those who don't use the gap spotting method, but maybe use problem setting, um, it helps to identify the problem um, that you're trying to address and really just getting your hands around the scope of that particular problem. Um, it may lead to a conceptual model or hypothesis or a propositions or a research agenda. Again, uh, literature reviews have a variety of different purposes um, and it's not um, one purpose. I always think the word literature review is a bit of a misnomer because it sounds like it's just a summary or a description of what's gone before, but it's actually a far more strategic tool um, and it needs to be more uh, analytical than um, descriptive uh, in order to really do its job properly. So I don't like the word review particularly, but I can't think of a better one. So that's the one we're gonna go with. Okay, what it is not, it's not just a description of what everyone else has done. Um, in fact, you could never possibly do that in a lit review section of a journal article or a report or of a thesis because, you know, there's enough to often fill many, many, many volumes and books on a topic. And so it's really about saying what part of the literature is going in your particular lit review and being really strategic about what are you trying to achieve with this. It's not a war and peace of everything we know on a particular topic. Um, so it needs to be really analytical. Uh, and I think that's really critical because I know that I've got students that tend to want to do an exhaustive search of, you know, the world at large. And it's like, as a supervisor, I don't want to read that. Um, in fact, I want you to be able to put one page with what do we know and what don't we know and convey that meaning to me um, verbally, uh, which means you have to start making some decisions. And so if you're doing things like systematic literature reviews or critical lit reviews, you've got to actually start putting those filters on. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about doing a lit review is where are the boundaries of it and what, what on earth are you trying to do? And sometimes that's not clear in the beginning when you start, but at some point the penny needs to drop where you start going, okay, now I know. And so what that means is that you tend to do a lot of reading well beyond what you're actually going to be able to include, but you don't know which part of the literature you're going to need so you kind of have to at least know where the edges are um, to start being able to sort of zoom in or, or zoom out on different um, features of it. And for students um, who actually want to do things in a very linear way, this becomes quite frustrating. I think it's one of the most frustrating aspects of doing research is just trying to set those boundaries. Um, and because we don't know what we don't know, you know, it, it's, it's like trying to catch water with open hands. Everything's kind of running through and you just can't get that grip. Um, so that iterative process is kind of, you've got to go into it with that mindset, but at some point go, 
I've got to make some decisions now and I've got to have the confidence to put the boundaries around it. And that's hopefully what the steps I'm going to show you will do. But in particular, this is where mind maps can really just help focus attention um, and move us from being descriptive and trying to have everything known you know, to humanity um, on a topic and actually getting, getting that focus and doing it in a fairly reasonable time frame. So in terms of um, types of literature review, um, there's a very good paper out by um, Grant and colleagues in a journal on health information libraries, which, you know, to a group of accountancy academics, you might go, well, how is that relevant? But what they do is actually cover off on different types of lit reviews, which are relevant to anyone in any area. And that's what I like. It's not actually just about health. It might be a health journal, but what they're covering is relevant more broadly. And this has been one of the best typologies or lists that I've seen that covers all different types of literature reviews, what the methods are, what the strengths and weaknesses of each approach are, and when and how to use it. So before you start, you need to work out what type of literature review are you in fact doing. And then you need to then be able to justify why that type and why not another type. One of the most common things that I see the terminology being interchanged in marketing is between a systematic literature review and a critical literature review. So things are called a systematic lit review and in fact they actually are a critical lit review. And the, the main difference between those two types of lit reviews is a systematic literature review which really comes out of the medical literature has a quality assessment stage that most marketing um, studies either can't do or um, you know it just doesn't work when you do a quality assessment of articles it's inherently biased towards randomized control trials which you can understand in medicine are like really important it's biased against qualitative papers and it's biased against conceptual papers there's been lots written about that but no one seems to come up with a better sort of solution and so what that means is if you say you're doing a systematic literature review then you have to include quality assessment and what that could do is actually chuck out all of your conceptual pieces or your qualitative work out of, out of the review process. So I personally choose to use a critical literature review approach. So I don't worry about the quality criteria that is in that um, systematic literature review process. So the PRISMA approach requires a quality assessment. The way that I assure quality is I look at the rankings of the journals and I might say I want all quartile one on Sky Margo journals. So that's the inherent lens that I'll put over and I'll go, you know what, I'm good enough with that. Um, so you sort of have to work out if you're not going to do a systematic literature review and use the formal quality procedures that are required in that process, you're going to have to have some other proxy for it. But I do want to include conceptual papers and I do value qualitative work. And I value quantitative work that's not a randomised control trial. And I don't want to lose them in the process simply because I'm following a medical journal kind of procedure. So just be mindful of your terminology there. And that if you're publishing journals that typically use the incorrect approach and label it something different, you're going to have to clarify what is a critical lit review and why are you doing it? Why are you not calling it a systematic lit review? So there's just some little nuances there. Um, the other thing to think about is, are you doing white literature or gray literature? Um, the white literature is a lot easier to access and it's easier to find the boundaries of it. It's in the databases. The gray literature is unbelievably difficult. There is um, a way of doing a gray literature literature review. One of my research students, Lucas Whitaker, um, is across that um, to the point where we decided not to do that when we saw the complexity of it, because that is, um, you know, that is any publicly available you know, government report, industry report, you know, and that's super hard to get the search terms right with that. So if you're going to do that, you do need to follow a different procedure for scoping it and being systematic in that process. Um, if anyone's interested in that process, contact Lucas Whitaker, who's one of our research students. He does a, a journal article for that. I don't tend to do that, um, that, that kind of uh, literature review. I tend to typically do white literature. And I, I do like that little image down the bottom that sort of shows the labels and what fits in between, um, you know, white, black, and gray. Um, so we've got, you know, shades of gray in, um, uh, in academia. So again, think about what are you trying to do and how you're gonna do it before you even start. Um, this slide actually comes from my experience as a journal editor. Um, I'm not gonna go through the detail, but it's something that 
you know, I've observed as a journal editor and actually really fits neatly into this particular presentation. Um, you need to think about the format that you, you're doing and setting it out. And so you need to think about who is your audience. If you're doing a literature review for a, um, a government agency, that is a very different format to doing a literature review in a journal for a journal article, which is also a different format to doing it in a thesis. So you just need to think about who is the audience, what is the format, and find an example of an existing literature review in that particular format and use that as kind of your, 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 your how-to guide. Um, one of the things that I've struggled with with working with particularly government agencies is they typically have something in mind about what they want the output to look like. They don't always share that with you, but they certainly know what they don't like when you show them the finished report and they go, no, I didn't really like that. Can you just completely change it? So I've learned really clearly to try and really understand what my audience wants and making sure I try and at least get an example from, particularly if it's a client, to say, I know where I'm heading um, because that frames everything about how you start. You need to think about your contribution, about why you're doing um, the literature review. Um, there is a rigor around this. So if you're doing a background literature section in a journal article, you don't need a systematic lit review for that. But if your whole article is conceptual and you're gonna use the literature, then you're gonna to have to do something more rigorous than just, hey, yeah, I'll pick these articles and these are the ones that, you know, came in when I did an hour search on Saturday. So, the, and you need to make that process explicit. Uh, and then finally, just, you know, style, um, you know, and have content that's clear and have content, content that's interesting. Don't be boring. Okay, so what then are these steps? So these are the seven steps that um, I follow. I, I don't think they're particularly rocket science, um, but my starting point as a business academic is always my managerial problem. For other people, you know, it could be their theoretical lens, but I always... I call it top and tailing. I start with my managerial problem and I end with my managerial kind of recommendations. That's that's how I do all my research. Um, it's how I write. Um, you know, everyone does this differently, but, I, you know, I come from a really practical background. I came to academia late, um, hence why I felt like I'm always trying to catch up to everyone else. I didn't come straight through from undergrad and go straight in in my 20s. You know, um, I worked in the real world had a family and then came to academia late. So I think I always have that really practical hat on and I would consider myself a pracademic, um, not, not a theoretical researcher. So hence, this is my kind of approach to a lit review. Okay, so the search strategy. This is actually based on the QUT librarian search strategy. When I was teaching consumer behaviour years ago, the first assignment I set the students was actually doing um, a search strategy and then doing up mind maps of the literature. So some of the examples I'm going to give you actually came from the undergrads. And I think, well, if an undergrad can do this, so too can any research student and an academic. And it was only when I started forcing the students to make their search really explicit and use these tools that actually the output beyond that actually got better. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe I should start doing this process as well. So again, I spend half of my life trying to make my own processes explicit to myself and to make it explicit to my colleagues and to my um, students so that I don't just make wild comments like, oh, you're a bit descriptive, not very critical. And, my, and people go, I've got no idea what that actually means. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. So for me, transparency in the process of research uh, is a way to create shared meaning with my colleagues, um, but also how to explain to people that I work with kind of what I mean by um, the tasks. So the first thing here, and I'm gonna use the example of men's grooming products uh, because that's what I happen to have the example for. Um, and so for those who don't know um, what men's grooming products are, you know, it's shaving, uh, it's hair. Um, it's all the stuff that really came out in the 80s with the launch of the term metrosexual. And then, you know, so David Beckham, I think was the pinup boy in those days. Um, with all the products and it turns out this is a, a massive growth market and this is where the beauty industry and cosmetics industry saw themselves really expanding and picking up a lot of extra money um, around this. Um, what was interesting at the time is that it wasn't men buying the products, it was women buying the products for the men to use. So it was an interesting market in that the products were bought not by the user but by the key influencer. 
But what industry also recognised was that um, when men buy a grooming product, they tend to stick to it. So their loyalty levels are really high, but they don't want to be spending lots of time on it. So it was a really good growth area, um, but there was a lot of challenges. And so, again, that managerial problem um, needed to govern the, the literature um, review. So it was why were the sales increasing in Australia? And what were the challenges that marketers were facing? Particularly, men didn't want to publicly seek information. They don't really be seen standing in the um, supermarket store sort of comparing um, face creams. Um, so there was a whole bunch of stuff around private and public consumption about who was buying it. Um, and then therefore how to market this product properly. And that was the sort of opening um, gambit with the managerial problem. So what... Um, and, you know, we'll spend just a minute, uh, I'm going to ask you to do little tasks, but you don't have to sort of do them online, just sort of note down. I've included them in the slide so that if you were to use this process, you could sort of stop at each slide and go, okay, now I've got a task I have to do. So briefly, write out, think of a lit review you've got to do and jot down, what are you trying to achieve with, your, with the lit review? What's its purpose? What's the problem you're trying to address? And if you don't know the answer to that, that's your first problem. That's where you've got to start. So just grab a piece of paper or open a window up and briefly jot down. So if you don't know, that's also good, but it means you can't get started on the lit review yet. I should have like music sort of, you know, playing just for these little one minute. Do, 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 do. So I'm going to whiz through this pretty quickly, but again, you can use the slides. But knowing where your sticking points are in the process is just as important as actually being able to go through the process. And this helps to overcome blank page syndrome. When you open up your page and go, I don't even know where to start. So you close it and go and put the washing on. Okay, so let's assume you know why you're doing this now. Okay, the next stage is you've got to write down what are the key words here in the topic that you're interested in. So this is the beginning of our search strategy. So for instance, if I was looking at masculinity and grooming products, there was two aspects. So I need to know um, about the why sales are increasing. Why is the grooming market no longer female saturated? And I want to look around the challenges. And I want to know what the literature is saying about these challenges. Why is there a lack of awareness? Why is there a reluctant attitude? So I'm not looking at everything to do with men's grooming products. My managerial problem is setting the boundaries already. I'm not looking at um, uh, the types of products at this point. So you can already see that managerial problem has already scoped down my lit review to start with. Hence why I like to start with a problem. Otherwise, it could be a massive search if I'm just doing men's grooming products. So once you've written down what you're trying to achieve in the key words and in your own words, the topic, then start to write down the key concepts, the key terms. So what I came up with is three concepts I'm kind of looking at here. Concept one is around men masculinity and men's um, male gender roles and the effect on male grooming use. The second concept is something around self-concept, self-esteem. And then the third concept is the ideal self as perceived by men in the marketing of men's grooming products. Now, there's many other concepts you could have come up with based on the same strategy, but that's just where I was heading in my own mind. So start jotting down those. And you also might want to list any exclusion criteria. What are you not interested in? What's out of scope here based on your managerial problem? Now, this can take quite a long time to figure out. But trust me, if you can have these boundaries already in your head, it makes your search far more focused. Um, and you'll get, you know, you won't end up with 10,000 articles coming up in your search, which is, again, when you shut it down and go and make a cup of tea. Okay, moving on again. Okay, so now we're going to start thinking of what are the other words, what are the synonyms or truncations for some of these search terms? Um, and there's a number of ways that you can do this. Um, 
can anyone, you know, unmute and share? How would you go about finding out what are the other words? What are the synonyms for the key terms that you're, you're looking for? How do you guys do it? Anyone willing to share? Um, user thesaurus. Yeah, that's a great way to start. Thanks, Kevin. What other ways do you, do you Gavin? Um, I find the key words on the articles that I've found with the key words I've got. Yeah, yeah, that really iterative approach. Especially if you've got some of the seminal articles. Google Scholar is fantastic, is your friend here. So finding articles that have cited the key articles and then have a look at those key words um, or the ones that initially come up, go and have a look and see how else they've, they might have reframed it. And so you start to really get a, a, a depth of knowledge uh, around, um, around those synonyms. Um, at some point, you have to kind of draw the line and say, okay, I've, I've got enough. Uh, you may even decide you want to keep adding to that synonym list as you start to find articles. So it becomes a very iterative process. Just when you think you're out of the you know, search strategy stage, you'll end up back in it at some point. And that's when you've got to go, enough. I've, I've done my due diligence here. Yep, there might be some other words, but the extra effort it takes to go and find that extra one word isn't going to really yield enough. So it, it's, it's not a perfect approach, but it, it's, it's enough. You may even decide to run this past colleagues as well. People who might be potential reviewers, and you go, can you think of any other words? And chances are, you know, they might pick a one or two, but it's not going to be all that helpful. So I would then put those underneath the concepts. Um, and you can see now we've already got quite a lot of words now that potentially we can, we can search for. Um, what becomes important then is using your, your, your truncation, so your, the little asterisks. So, and that's particularly important if you've got um, words that change spelling, um, you know, between American English, Australian, you know, British English or English English you know, the original English. Um, so instead of marketing, markets, market share, you might just go market um, asterisk. That picks up all those extra ones. But if there's too many of those, then you go, no, chucking that one out, I'm doing back to marketing. Um, so just be aware of using that. It's a really cool little term, um, particularly with like behaviour is one that, you know, you'll either pick up the British spelling or you'll pick up the American, but you'll exclude one of them if you don't use your little asterisk. So um, these are really helpful things that I've learned from librarians over the years. So, you know, um, it's also useful in your teaching, get a librarian to come and talk about this because you just remember and you pick up things that you've forgotten. I always find no matter how many times I hear the librarians explain how to do stuff, there's always a tip that I pick up that I have either didn't know or I forgot. Okay, so then the next thing is start to structure the search phrase. And again, you could just immediately start banging away on your computer. I actually prefer to take the time to sit and type this out. It's a bit like when I do statistics analysis, rather than just going in and doing it, I should write it and go, no, no, what are my IVs? What are my DVs? And I just start to then tick off because if I get distracted or interrupted, then I forget what I've done. So if you've got a list, you can at least tick things off and go, yep, done that, done that, so that you don't end up redoing stuff later. Um, or you start to see what's not working and go, okay, I'm not taking that approach. So I think, again, making it transparent and explicit um, is important. So these are some of the search phrases that you could use. So your Boolean um, in operators are really important, using them properly. So if you do X and Y, that's going to be a really broad search. If you go X or Y, clearly you're narrowing it. But if you've got lots of terms, X and Y and Z, but not... B and C and D, and if you put the but not instead of an or or something like that, you're going to end up with a, a bit of a dog's breakfast. So try not to make it overly complicated, but if you're getting like 10 or 20,000 um, um, items coming up in your search, you know, clearly you're going to have to start refining that down. And then you do want to save that search somewhere that you can go back. Also, a tip here is that you can auto extract what you find in a search and it goes straight out of the database into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, do not ask me how to do that. That's something that typically I get my research assistants to do. All my students, they know way more about that process, but I do know that they can do it. So you can extract a thousand articles and that's the title, the DOI, the abstract, the author name, all of that. You don't have to retype it or do it individually. So if you've been doing that manually, you don't have to do it anymore. 
the, prob the, the, the only downside now is I can't tell you how to do that. I just know you can do that. Um, so librarians can tell you or really cool and good research students will be able to tell you um, how to do that, but you can do it. And that saves you a huge amount of time in doing that. Um, and you can also auto extract the PDFs as well of the articles. So there's some um, very quick processes that are now out there uh, compared to when I did my PhD and everything was um, pretty manual. Uh, and you need to think about what databases and searches that you're going to use. Again, it comes back to you doing white literature, um, uh, you're doing grey literature. Sometimes picking databases that overlap can be helpful because, you know, uh, you might have a, a whole heap in um, um, ABI Inform. If I also do Psych Info, there's going to be an overlap and I'm going to be picking up extra things um, with these. So have a think about what disciplines might do the topic that you're interested in and are you interested in stuff from other disciplines so you might be going i only want to know the stuff within accountancy because that's the scope of my problem and if so that's great but if you want to know or you're doing a topic that might actually also be looked at in it or it might be looked at in sociology or it might be looked at in health then you're going to have to go to either a much broader database or you're going to have to go to multiple discipline specific databases so you do need to think about how focused on your own discipline do you need to be to refine it? Um, or are you open in the first instance for, you know, a broader approach? Bearing in mind that the broader you go, the more articles that you're going to start with, and then you're going to have to put some filters on it in terms of timeframes um, or on um, uh, search terms. So then you need to record your search protocol. And this is one that um, I have uh, did previously in an industry um, report, um, but also we've published a journal article out of it. So we did the same search process, but what went in the report was far more practical how-to. What went in the journal article was um, far more theoretical. So same source of information. There's obviously a lot of crossover between the two, but we did things quite differently because we had two different audiences um, for it. I think if you can publish reports and academic stuff out of the same sort of project, I think that's when you're on a winner because your research gets out to the real world in a usable way and you're also able to make um, theoretical impact as well. So I think I always try to do both, but, you know, they are two different processes. And typically the report gets done first, I make that deliverable, and then I can move on, take a breath, and do the theoretical stuff in my own time frame without having all those deadlines jumping on top of me. So in this particular search, we're looking at um, what works and what doesn't in energy efficiency interventions. So we identified initially 3,310 articles. No one wants to code those. So that's way too many. And so we then went through the systematic um, or, um, review process and we actually did do quality assessment um, in this. Uh, to narrow it down. We got it down to 107 articles, which is still a lot, but it's a lot less than 3,310. By definition, we were clearly excluding stuff. And we just had to justify what those filters were and why we were excluding at each point. Um, and the reviewers were quite happy with the process and that we were very explicit about it, but it did obviously narrow um, where the, what the contribution was. And we were basically looking at um, uh, developed countries we were looking at residential, not commercial. You know, we have to just keep filtering stuff down to get to that 107 reports. But you can see we're very clear about what's what's losing. And I do like those visuals um, to show people very clearly where you started and how you got to where you were going. This is one from one of my research students, um, confirmation documents. He's doing a systematic lit review, looking at deep fakes. Um, and he's looking across different disciplines. And so I really like the way that he included this search protocol in his confirmation document, because it means I could, someone could replicate it, but also makes it very explicit what the process is. And there's no vagaries around what was going to go in and what was going to go out. And he's showing um, the number of results that occur from that search. So you could ask one of your students to do that up and bring it to a meeting with you. Or if you are a student, you could do this up. And this assures your supervisor that you know you've done due diligence, um, and it can help you make some choices around where you might want to go and why you might not go in a certain pathway. So again, making things explicit and um, transparent. Um, reviewers like this. You may not include it in a journal article, but it might be a supplementary file for review that you do include um, so that they understand what your process um, was and that there's a rigor around this. So let's move on to then the mind map stuff. 
Okay, so this is an example that my undergrads produced and I really liked it. So I got them to do this search process and then I said, go and do a literature review search. And I gave them this topic of alcohol use um, in Anglo and Asian cultures. Um, so I actually um, wanted to collect data on this and look at um, how alcohol was used across different cultures and why we had binge drinking rates that vary across these two different um, groups. So the first thing was to have a look at what the literature said. And so I really like the way that this student um, did these two mind maps. Um, so Anglo-Saxon and Asian um, type um, terminology came out of a global framework around cultural clusters. There's 10 in the GLOBE framework. So that came from the literature. Um, they looked at what the definitions were and then they pulled the literature out. So if you were looking at that, what observations could you make just seeing those two mind maps about what do we know and what don't we know in the literature if you were to do a cross-cultural study? What do you have in one of those mind maps that's maybe not in the other? And I'm just like gonna ask you just off the top of your head, what can you see just in those pictures? Anyone care to volunteer? What's different, you know, what are, where are the gaps? Either across both or within one of them. What, what are we missing in the literature body there? And what they've done is they've used a, um, some theory as, to, to code. So they've used um, uh, cultural systems to actually develop those um, black and white headings. And then they've used that to organise the literature. We've got Ellie and Jamie both saying, Rebecca, rites of passage in the Asian. Oh, great. I didn't realise it was in the chat. Okay, yeah. I'll the Sorry. Chat. Yes, yeah, you can see that. So you can see we've got some stuff in rites of passage on the Anglo-Saxon literature body, but we've got nothing in the Asian literature body about it. That could be interesting. That could be where we want to focus. Or we might ask why. Is it because there are no rites of passage in alcohol in the Asian culture? What else can you see there? And I can see a few people pick that one up. Where is the literature, where is the dominance of the literature? Oh, I can see Tracy has mentioned also myths. Yeah, we don't have um, a great deal where there's nothing on myths in the Anglo-Saxon literature. There's a little bit in Asian, the Asian literature. Where's the dominance of the literature? Where does everybody seem to focus? Uh, Rebecca, could I just ask you, uh, you might have mentioned this, what's the significance of the colour coding? Is that just the researcher's own choice? Ooh, I was going to get to that. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> the colour coding is actually really important here. I thought it was. <laughs> it's really important. Otherwise, it's a bunch of words, right? Yeah. Um, so the, um, and I'm trying to remember in this example what those colour codes were. Normally you should put a legend at the bottom to say what the colour codes mean. Um, the colour codes can mean um, empirical or conceptual. It could mean um, certain countries uh, or it could mean um, um, similar sources of references. To be honest, in this one, I've left off the legend and I didn't do these mind maps, so I couldn't tell you that. But when you, you can see lots of pink and green in there, that's, that, that's telling you something. So you need to use colour really purposefully in your mind maps. It's really super helpful. When a certain colour jumps up, that's telling you there's a lot on that. So looking at this, you can see there's a lot on conventions um, in both uh, literature bodies. And you can certainly see there's a fair amount on social structure. Now then the question is, why? Is that where the literature has to go? And is that where you need to continue? Or do you go into the areas that maybe you've got less? But maybe there's less literature for a very good reason. And this is where the gap spotting stuff can be dangerous. Just because there's a gap doesn't mean you need to fill it. It might be a gap because it's actually not, it's irrelevant or not interesting. So don't assume just because there's a gap, you do it. Gap, um, you know, filling a gap is the best of the worst reasons to do research. I told that as a PhD student. 
So you're still going to make sense of this. You're still going to work out what you're going to do. But you could take this to a supervisor or to a colleague and go, okay, here's what we know and what we don't. And you can do it in one page. And to me, that's really cool. Um, you'll notice that there are numbers that are in each of those boxes. That's your source reference source. So I do up an annotated bibliography. The numbers mean absolutely nothing apart from number one is this article. It's just a quicker way of actually putting the references in there without words, because if you've got five references that can take up like two or three lines in a, in a bubble and it, it just clouds it. If you've got a number, much easier to do that, but the numbers don't mean anything. But what it means is when you go to write it up, you immediately can go back to your original source that you've got the information from. So um, no point taking lots of notes and mind mapping and then you don't know where to um, where you found all that stuff from because that's super frustrating. So you've got to build this into your process from the start. So an undergrad did that. And I think if an undergrad can do it, you know, so can we. But it's a really, that was based on that very systematic search strategy that I showed them. And they use frameworks and theory to start to code. Now, if you use a different cultural framework, you would have a very different looking mind map. So you do have to figure out how am I going to organize this information? So you might start with this just wild mind map, and then you've got to start theming it and putting it into um, uh, concepts. And that's 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 the kind of creativity side. There's no right way of doing it, but you do need a sense of structure about your mind map and how you might do it could be different to someone else. So uh, here's another one that um, uh, where they then, then well, when that she's moved on and gone, all right, I'm going to pull both of these literature bodies together now in one conceptual framework of the literature. This is not a measurement model, obviously, but it's now saying I need to pull it all together. And she used Hofstede's uh, five cultural dimensions to actually start to have a different lens on that literature body. And those colors there um, uh, were reflective of the concepts like rite of passage. So that's again, starting to look at how you might move towards pulling it all together. And again, it's a pretty clever way of doing it, I think. So I'll leave that one for you. Okay, so here's the low tech version. Um, this was me scribbling out. And I've got to say, I am an absolute um, scribble out with textures. I have got multicolored Sharpies here, and I have a pile of post it notes. I'm an absolute post it note queen. And I like to just mind map out visually quickly because I otherwise I get stuck with the technology. Um, and this was a first cut at looking at um, what do we know in the literature about blood donation and the motivation for blood donors. So I'm going to very quickly start to do this. I'm using my color highlighters for my source. So you can see I've got three journal articles I just quickly mind mapped. And what that's telling me is the literature under donor motivation um, seems to talk a lot about um, whether you're a first time or you're a repeat donor and the motivations vary there. Um, looking at loyalty levels, the benefits of donating. And then I started looking at oh, what are the opportunities in the literature? So I started you know, drawing that out and then I transfer that into something that's um, a little um, more electronic that I can then share and give to colleagues. But I do use the low tech approach as well. So don't be afraid to do that. Okay, here's one that was done up um, in the electricity sector. And so we worked with one of the electricity retailers and they wanted to know what predicted churn. Now churn is when people change retailer. So they wanted to know what are the factors that predict whether someone will switch retailers or not. And what became very clear to us very quickly was that we needed to divide the literature into residential and or residential slash commercial. And what we found is um, that the factors that dictated whether a business changed retailers were almost the same as why um, residential customers changed. And that was eye-opening for this retailer because they had a strategy person that dealt with business to business and they had a strategy person that dealt with consumers. And they thought that they were two completely different, you know, sets of behaviours. And I said, actually, the literature saying that the strategies you use in residential customers, you can also use in commercial, and they just did not want to believe it. But it wasn't until I, we presented this and went, well, here's the evidence. Everything for residential, or everything in commercial is also in residential. Residential actually had a bit more, but that means the strategies were transferable. They're not as different a group of people. And the reason for that is that business people are still people. They're, 
human beings. And we were taking this from a human perspective. So that was, I, we got lots of pushback on that, huge amounts of pushback. They just did not want to believe that. But when you can give them the literature, that helped. And so you can see the numbers there. That's the sources of the articles that we found um, in our search. Um, and then what we did is we had this massive long list and then we had to group it. So we then went, all right, we think we've got these macro, these larger headings. We've got some attitude stuff. We've got some social influence. We've got some resources stuff. So we started trying to group it. Now, this was not for publication, so I didn't need to overlay any kind of theoretical structure on this. But what I could have done is taken this and gone, let me find a theory that's got some categories that I can then use to help me um, code 25 different factors into maybe four different factors, just, just for simplicity's sake. But I did not overlay a theoretical structure here because I didn't need to. If I wanted to publish this, I'd have to go back to my full list of things and then go, okay, how am I going to theme that? Am I going to do it in a grounded theory way and just bubble up? Or can I spot the theory in it? And typically I can spot the theory in something um, and go, right, there's that framework. I'm seeing it that I can use to then sort and classify. Uh, and we did use some white literature in this from the retailer themselves. Okay, so here's another mind map example. You, I'm going to be giving you a lot of electricity ones because that's one of the sectors that I work in. That's where I've done most of the mind mapping. Um, and so this was a segmentation study uh, that we did. And what we wanted to do is work out how does the electricity sector typically segment customers and where are the gaps? Where do we need to go? And so we just used the stock standard marketing segmentation framework where we had um, demographics, geographics, um, physical attributes of households, uh, behavior and psychographics. And so we just then were able to map what were then the sub factors that we had in the literature around segmentation. So looking at that, what are the themes that you can see? Where do you see anything missing? Or do you see anything missing? If you were to have to summarize and say in the electricity sector, the key way of segmenting um, electricity users is what? You can pop it in the chat or you can just say it. What seems to be the, the way that the electricity sector segments? Do they segment psychographically, geographically? What seems to be dominant? The trick here is look at the one that's got the most bubbles. No one's, okay, Kevin, thank you. Demographics. We've got a lot in demographics and there's actually a fair bit in psychographics. Where's the area where we've got the least? Yep, the least um, geographic, yep. And also some of the behavioral stuff. There's actually not much. It's not very nuanced. So you can see into psychographic, you've got lots and lots of nuanced ways of doing psychographic segmentation. Under behavioral, it's either the usage behavior, the benefit sort, or user status. And there's nothing as any nuance under usage behaviors or benefits. So that might say, well, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe we should just do psychographics and demographics. Maybe that's the actual way of doing it. Or we might go, well, maybe there's another way of doing it. So we'd, ha you know, we'd have to overlay and have a look at these articles and say, is there a problem with going with the dominant approach? Right? You can't just assume because it's dominant, it's wrong. But you've got to question it. You need to at least ask that question. Uh, here's another one. So we were looking at adoption of tariff reforms. So tariff is pricing. So Queensland changed the way that it did um, electricity pricing about two years ago, introduced cost reflective pricing. So charging more at peak times of the day. And we were doing research to say, in anticipation of this, how are customers going to react to this? And so we wanted to know what is already in the literature? What do we already know about this from other countries, other states, people have already done this before we start to try and figure out what we might do in Queensland. And so this was what was out there. So this told us 
how customers reacted. So the barriers for them actually doing using um, or picking cost reflective pricing for electricity, or what were their motivators? So again, what are the what are the where are the gaps here? What don't we know? So it could be subsections of some of these, or it could be there's actually some very important themes completely missing. So we know about lack of engagement, we know about split incentives, we know about privacy, we know about negative perceptions, we know about the incentive just isn't there. Actual outcomes. Yeah, we don't actually know whether this works or not. Good one, thanks, Kevin. So there's a place where we could say, well, actually, we should do a bit of research on this. Maybe the reason people don't change and use different electricity prices because they don't know if it's going to work or not. So basically, after you've sort of done all this and you've got your mind maps all going, then it's really time to put it all into practice. And um, the tool that I've showed you with those mind maps is from Bubble Us. Um, free account gets you about three of those. But if you use Miro, it's a lot freer. Uh, sorry, you've got more templates available and they do have those mind map templates. And that's what we showed you earlier in the week for those who went. So what you would now need to do is to start putting together a mind map for Lit Review. You need to think about what's its purpose. What do we know and what don't we know? Um, you might have that extracted Excel list from your search. You need to number them and then start adding concepts and article numbers um, to the mind map. Importantly, you need to move those concepts around into themes and categories. Now you might freeform those themes, or if you do what I do, I like to use theory. So I start to see the themes and go, oh, that reminds me of this theory. So you can do it however you want, but you do need to categorize. Otherwise you'll end up with a hundred bubbles and you'll have like two point font in them all and you won't be able to read it. At some point you have to organize it. Um, and then you need to sit back and say, what does it mean? What do we already know? What is missing? And the things that are missing, do they matter? Um, and then just finally in wrapping up, you need to consider your target journal. So go to the target journal, see what they've done on the topic area. Um, one of the authors is likely to be, you know, a reviewer, have a look at what they've done. Go back and see, do you need to backfill um, anything, um, uh, you know, to make sure that you're actually addressing things. Pick your target journal before you even start writing up your lit review. You need to know where you're heading in order to, um, to get to your destination. And there's just some references for you about different um, reviews.